Hello, everybody. I'm Tom. And I'm Frederick. So today we're going to talk about observability and what Frederick and I see as the future, or potentially the future. Hopefully everyone here is familiar with the term observability. Yes? No? OK, so observability can normally be defined as these kind of three pillars, um, metrics, logs, and traces. This is a, a mental model for people who are maybe new to the space and, and helping to get a handle on what they need to do and what they need to implement. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what they are and the projects in this space. Um, metrics, normally time series data. This is kind of if you're doing trends of memory usage or latency. And the CNCF has some great projects in this space. Open metrics is a exposition format, so a format for exporting metrics from your application. And Prometheus is probably now the de facto monitoring system for, for Kubernetes and apps on Kubernetes. Um, so logs, sometimes events. Um, in Kubernetes, this would be what comes out of stood out on your containers. Uh, in this space, the CNCF has FluentD, a log shipping agent. Um, and then traces. This is potentially the hardest one to sum up in a single sentence. Uh, we're trying to find something short and catchy. So I think of distributed traces as a way of recording and visualizing a request as it traverses through the many kind of services in your application. Uh, in this space, we've got open tracing. I guess now we should say, uh, what is it, open telemetry. So uh, I didn't get a chance to put the new logo in. And then we have uh, Jaeger, another CNCF project to do um, tracing, one we use ourselves. Over to you. So just as some, Tom has already mentioned, um, the three pillars of observability were really meant or were really used as a framework. Um, and uh, for people who have just gotten started on their journey in observability, and that's exactly where, in 2018, there's been a conversation, uh, and there w were some critique about this, that um, this is, while we can collect all of this data, we may not actually be focusing on um, solving people's problems. We have all of this data, and we're telling people, if you have metrics, if you have logs, and if you have tracing, you've solved observability. You have an observable system. But um, we don't think that's uh, that's the case. There is so much more uh, for observability to come. Cool. So in this talk, Frederick and I are going to present three predictions. Um, it's always a bit of a risky business giving predictions. Um, we'll probably be wrong, um, but we're going to give it a go anyway. So first prediction, there will be more correlation between the different pillars. We think this is the year when we're going to start breaking down the walls and we're going to start seeing joined up workflows. Um, I want to talk about three examples of what you can do right now. And hopefully, after the talk, you can come to me with more examples. And in the next few years, we can, we can make this really happen. So metrics, logs, and traces. The three examples I've got are being able to you know, look at a graph of, let's say, your server latency and instantly being able to switch to the logs relevant for that service. Um, the second example would be when looking at those logs, um, finding, let's say, the slowest query that's causing that peak in latency that you're diagnosing, being able to instantly jump to the trace for that request and see where it spent time throughout your architecture. And the final example is similarly looking at that uh, latency graph, wanting to jump straight to the trace. So the first system, this is actually a project that I work on myself, uh, is called Loki. Uh, this is an open source log aggregation system by Grafana. We launched it at KubeCon in Seattle six months ago. Uh, had an absolutely great response, like loads of people have uh, given us really good feedback. Loki uses Prometheus's service discovery to automatically find the jobs within your cluster. It then takes that service discovery and the labels that that service discovery gives you and associates them with the log stream. And it's this kind of systematic, um, consistent metadata that's the same between your logs and your metrics that enables that switching between the two seamlessly. So that's the first example. The second example is Elasticsearch and Zipkin. So Elasticsearch is probably the most popular log aggregation system. Even I can admit that. Um, and, and Zipkin's probably the, open, the original open source distributed tracing system. Um, there's in Kibana, which is the Elasticsearch UI. There is a, a thing called Field Formatters. And some chap on Twitter set up his uh, Kibana to insert a link using a field formatter um, so that he could instantly link to his Zipkin traces. Well, I think this is really cool. I'm really looking forward to adding this kind of feature to Grafana. 
So then the third example would be Open Census, or now Open Telemetry, of course. Um, they have a thing called exemplars. This is where a few example trace IDs are associated with every single bucket in a histogram. And then when you go to that bucket and you can see you know, what's causing this high latency, you can link straight to the, uh, the trace. I, you know, I like that open census and open telemetry is open source, but I'm not actually yet aware of an open source system on the server side that's actually implemented this workflow. Um, if I'm wrong, come and find me afterwards and uh, let me know. So that was three examples of what you can do right now, how you can do this correlation that I'm talking about. Um, I'm really looking for more examples and looking at ways in which we can make this more automatic. What do you think? I think what you said about metadata is exactly the way uh, that this is going to work. I, I think metadata is what's going to allow us to do all of this correlation, but still be able to build systems that are useful individually, but also as a whole and do, do all this great correlation um, across the signals. So that's prediction number one. And prediction number two is we believe that th we are going to be seeing a lot more signals and uh, new analysis. Now, as humans, uh, we like the number three. That's why maybe we've settled on the three pillars of observability. But we, be be we believe there is so much more data um, that can help us have insight into our, into our running systems. Um, and, but it doesn't stop with data. We, when we have this data, we actually need to do something useful with it, right? So it's signals and analysis uh, that are going to bring us forward. And I want to show you a concrete example of what maybe in the future we'll be calling the fourth pillar of observability. So what I've got over here is a graph of memory that, uh, where, that I've created using Prometheus. Um, and what we're seeing is um, memory usage over time. And we see a sudden drop of memory. And then we are seeing a new line that has a different color. And in Prometheus, this means it's a distinct time series. But we're actually looking at the same workload here. So what we're seeing in this graph is actually what we call an oom kill. So when our, our application has um, allocated so much memory that the kernel has said, stop here. Um, I'm going to kill this process um, and go on. So that's, that's what's called an oom. And our existing systems can show us all of this, um, all this data, all this usage over time. And our logs can tell us that the OOM has happened. But when we're the, an, a developer of an application like this where this happens, we actually want to know how can we fix this. So what we want is a memory profile of a point in time where memory usage was at its highest so that we know which part of our code we need to fix. So it turns out this is not an entirely new space, and Google has published a number of um, papers, white papers on this. And there are, are some proprietary software uh, that do this, but it hasn't really been solved in the open source space. So let's imagine for a second if we had a Prometheus-like system that periodically took memory profiles of our application then we would kind of be creating memory profiles over time. We could maybe even call it a time series of profiles. Um, and then if we had taken every 10 seconds or every 15 seconds a memory profile of our ooming, ooming application, maybe we would actually be able to figure out what has caused this, this particular incident. Um, so it turns out I've actually uh, looked into this space, and I would, I've started a, a, a new project called Comprof, uh, Continuous Profiling, because I'm not a very imaginative uh, person. Um, and I'd like to invite everybody to uh, help me um, and explore this space together with me so maybe we can all work together on the fourth pillar of observability. Now, I've only mentioned uh, how we can collect this data, but how can we make even more use out of this data than just looking at the normal memory profile? So I've got a pprof profile over here. That's basically what the Go runtime gives us um, to analyze our, our running systems. And um, as it turns out, as I was putting together these slides, I found a memory leak in Conprof. Um, <laughs> so 
But how about if Conprov could have told me which part of Conprov is actu actually has a memory leak, right? So if we have all of this data over time as a, modeled as a time series, um, if we look at two memory profiles in a consecutive way, Conprov could be, or, or any continuous profiling system could maybe even identify which systems have allocated more memory over time and haven't freed it, which potentially could be the thing that we have to fix. So that's prediction number two. I think um, we're going to be seeing a lot more signals and um, analysis. And I've only shown you one example. Um, but I think there's going to be a lot more out there to explore. Um, so. So you're going to continue the well-worn tradition of re-implementing Google Ideas in open source. Yeah. Excellent. So prediction number three, the rise of index-free log aggregation. Um, we've been seeing this de develop over the last, well, six months to a year or so. A lot of people have been saying things like, just give me log. Just give me grep, sorry. Just give me log files and grep. Um, I think, you know, the systems like Splunk and Elasticsearch you know, they give us a tremendous amount of power to search and analyze our logs. But all of this power comes with a lot of, I'm not going to say responsibility, it comes with a lot of complexity and expense. And before we had Splunk and Elasticsearch, logs were just stored as files on disk, maybe in some centralized server somewhere. And you would just go on and grep it. And I think we're starting to see the desire for simpler index-free log aggregation systems. You know, effectively, everything old is new again. So I'm going to give you three examples again, because three is a very aesthetically pleasing number. Um, the first example is a project called OKLog OK by someone called Peter Borgen. Um, he started this project, I think, just over a year ago. Unfortunately, it's been discontinued. Um, but it had some really great ideas about distributing uh, grep over a cluster of machines and being able to basically just brute force your way through your logs. Um, made it a lot easier to operate, a lot cheaper to run. Uh, everyone knows kubectl logs. I think if we squint, we can think of this as a log aggregation system. You've got a central place. You can go and query your logs. It goes and stores them in a distributed way. Um, I think, you know, for me, the thing that was really missing from kubectl logs is being able to get logs for pods that were missing, pods that had disappeared or pods that had oomed or failed, especially during rolling upgrades. Um, and that's really why I started Loki. So again, Loki, second mention, sorry about that. Loki is an index-free log aggregation system designed to be easy to run and easy to scale. Um, it doesn't come with the power of something like Elasticsearch. You wouldn't use Loki for business analytics. But Loki is really there for your developer troubleshooting use case. Um, yeah. So I'm really hoping that 2019 and 2020, we see the rise of these index-free, developer-focused log, ag log aggregation systems. And I'm hoping this means, as a developer, I'll never be told to stop logging so much data again. So that's our three, uh, that's our three predictions, more correlations between pillars, new signals and new analysis, and the rise of index three log aggregation. These are just three ideas. You know, if I think if we're lucky, we can watch this talk in a year or two and maybe get one out of three. Um, but yeah, what do you think? I think uh, the overarching theme of all of this is it's not, don't leave it up to Tom and I. Don't leave it up to the existing practitioners. This is a community project. Observability was not created by a few people. This, it, was created by, it was created by people who had lack of tooling in their troubleshooting. So I want everybody in this room to go and think next time as you're troubleshooting something and you're leaving your existing tooling, what data are you looking at? And what are you doing to troubleshoot your problem? And can we do that in a systematic way? Can we add all of this great metadata so that we can do the correlation, so that we can do new and exciting analysis on all of these things? And hopefully, we'll have more reliable systems as a result. Thank you. Thank you.